Hi, welcome back to Fall City. You guys can go ahead and stand. Welcome, you guys. I'm glad that you're here. It's nice to uh, see you face to face, be back in in person. Uh, and make sure you tell your friends. Uh, it, it's weird, like not being able to come to church. Like we take it for granted, right? And then now that we're back, I'm like, let's let's hit the ground running, right? So um, we're glad that you're here. You can follow us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram. Our website is fallcitychristian.com. Um, if you uh, if you want to 
bring tithes or offerings, but you don't necessarily want to walk it back to the basket or you want to do it digitally, you can text the amount to 84321. Um, after church today, we'll do a 15-minute devotion with our high school students. Uh, anything else? Say Is what? the meeting? Oh, we got tax statements? We got tax statements next week. Exciting stuff. That's why we have nerds here with us, because I can't do that. Tim, did you want to tell them if the meeting... Oh, yeah, so we didn't have our evening meeting, our night of vision. We're going to move that to next Sunday night. What time was it originally? Five? Five o'clock. Next Sunday night, we'll be here. There will be food. There will be drinks. And we will talk about um, what it means to be a part of Falls City and where we're heading. Sound good? All right, I'm going to pray, and then we'll get going. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you so much for the fact that we are here, that we can be here face to face, that we can be a part of the body, and that we can um, worship you. So, Lord, I pray that you get everything out of our way and let us focus on you this morning. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. fail me now you won't fail me now and in the waiting the same God is never late he's working all things out working all things out yes I will lift you high in the lowest valley yes I will bless your name joy when my heart is heavy all my days yes I
So we're at this point in time in, in the service, uh, and, and like I said before, that, that I think sometimes we tend to take for granted. The opportunity to, to just to slow everything down and to focus on the, the fact that we have hope and the reason why we have hope. Um, Jesus, just before he was arrested, he, um, he had this, this dinner, this supper in the upper room with his disciples. And uh, you've heard me say it before, they're sitting down, they're expecting a celebration. And um, he takes this, this bread and he breaks it and he says, uh, take eat for this is my body that will be broken for you. He kind of slides this bowl of wine across the table. He says, take drink for this is my blood that would be poured out for you cover a multitude of sins, okay? But then he says this. He says, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Like, do this often and know why you're doing it. Do this regularly and understand why. Understand why we are slowing down. Because I believe that in the celebration of the Passover at that point in time, he had to slow it down in order to have this conversation. Like, I know the party's here, but we've got some things to consider, some things to talk about, some time to, to slow down and understand why. And why is simply the fact that he came, he died, was buried, and he resurrected. And that gives us salvation. And not only does it give us salvation, not only does it give us eternity in heaven, but it gives us the opportunity to, to have life now. Like the rest of your life begins now. Not when you die and go to heaven. It begins now. And this is our opportunity to slow down. slow down and partake of this Lord's Supper and remember why. Father, we thank you so much we thank you so much for the fact that you had the wherewithal to slow things down in the midst of a, a, a crazy moment, a crazy night, a crazy few days, a crazy 33 years timing is perfect. Help us to do that today. Lord, help us to slow down and to understand why it is that we can be here. Help us not to take it for granted and help us to do this regularly, often, and in remembrance of you. It's in Jesus' name I pray.
God, I just thank you so much for who you are and for the fact that you already have gone before us and you know what's to come and so that we can rest in the comfort of knowing that no matter what happens, that you're in control and that you'll always be there. And I just thank you so much for everyone in this church and in this community. And I just ask that you would bless them and their families. And it's in your beautiful name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Are you guys leaving? Jerks. I'm just kidding. <laughs> it was good to have you here, though. Did I mention how nice it is to be back? I don't know if I mentioned that or not, but it is nice to be back. The only thing we were missing this morning was a bass player. I'm going to have to learn how to play the bass. Or maybe we can get my wife, Erin, to learn how to play the bass. What do you think, babe? No, okay. All right. So that was a soft no. I might, I might be able to work on her. We'll see. We'll see. Um, so we are in the final week of a series called I'm In. I thought it was going to be fitting to be able to do a series called I'm In and talk about how we can get involved, get invested, uh, stuff like that. And then I was literally out for two weeks, <laughs> which I, 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 I assume that that's humor on God's part. But um, this series is called I'm In. And I with with the new year, with it being January, how many of you guys have given up on a resolution already? Anybody? Anybody? You don't have to give up on it if you don't ever start it. So, um, and that's where I'm at. So I still have muffin top and man boobs, and it's just going to stay that way the rest of the year. So, um, but to start off the to start off the year with the mindset that I'm in, I think is a good thing. It's a positive thing. And it's not necessarily, hey, everybody, come and do what we do. But it's about, like, mentally, emotionally committing to being in. And uh, we, uh, we started off with, you are invited. I'm, I'm invited. Not necessarily invited to church, which is a good thing, okay? But I'm, in, I'm invited into this relationship with Jesus. I'm invited to, to come to him. Right, he said, he said, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. That was his invitation. Bring your mess to me. That's, that's a pretty good invitation to think about. Bring your mess to me. Nobody else wants like your drama. Nobody else wants your mess, right? But Jesus invites us to that. The second week, we talked about the fact that you are invaluable. A lot of us, I, I myself, I was talking to somebody this morning. I'm a very insecure person. I know I shouldn't be, and I know it's against what I've preached on before. Like I'm not smoking what I'm selling here sometimes, but I'm very insecure. But Jesus says that we are invaluable. invaluable. We saw him in an interaction with the woman at the well who came at noon so that she didn't have to interact with anybody else because people were talking smack about her, right? And, and her value wasn't there. And then Jesus took her from embarrassed to an ambassador, a, a, a servant of the king, sent with the message of the king and the power of the king. And she, when she realized who Jesus was, she was able to realize who she was because of him. And then last week, we talked about our spheres of influence, these, these, circle, these circles of people in our reach, right? Uh, from the closest to, to our fingertips, these circle of people in our reach, how we can influence them. A lot of times we think as an influencer, we have to have millions of followers on social media, or we have to have this voice that people listen to, but you do have a voice that people listen to. It just happens to be the people that are closer to you as opposed to the people that are way out there, right? And so we talked about uh, spheres of influence, and we realized that, that we are influential, and we have opportunity to invite the ones closest to us to do what, to do what um, Andrew did for his brother, Peter, to come and see. Don't listen to me talk about Jesus, which is good. It's good to talk about Jesus, okay? But come and see. There's something different when you experience it as opposed to just hear somebody talk about it. I talk about a lot of things. I talk about the fact that I used to be a, a pretty good athlete. That's not the case anymore. I can't prove that. I can't say come and see, right? 
I mean, I could, but then I would try and ollie a skateboard and roll my ankle. And then all my fat hits the ground and I end up in the hospital. And I'm, I'm down for like a month. It's ridiculous. It's the weight, I think. But um, I keep talking about that. I, I should probably do something about that. But this week we're going to talk about a different in. I'm in. I'm invested right? Uh, we put this at the end because we know people would be like, yeah, I'm, I'm invested, so let's get this out of the way now. Yes, the biggest report card of your life is shown through your calendar and your bank account, okay? Like you invest in what's important to you. And when we say invest, we typically are like, he's going to give us the offering and tithe speech, right? Well, that's a part of it, but that's not what I'm talking about today because I don't think the offering and the tithe speech works if we don't have the proper posture whenever we bring it. If we don't have the proper mindset, we are definitely expected to give of our tithe, of our time, and of our talent, right? Not just money, but also our time and also the things that we are good at. But I want to talk more about the mindset of that, the mindset of being invested then I do what to invest or even how to invest, right? I want to talk about our mindset, the posture that we bring to God whenever we do give of our tithe, our talent, and our time. And so there's this story in the New Testament. I don't know. I, I know I've never heard this story kind of associated with investment. But whenever, whenever I read it, it kind of wrecked me a little bit. And I was like, this is, this is, this is going to... This is going to cut deep. This is going to be good. Um, and it's this interaction with Jesus. And I think the best stuff that I've ever preached on in my life happens when screwed up people interact with Jesus. Right? I think it's because I can relate. <laughs> um, and, so, and so this woman and this man, they are pretty desperate to get to Jesus. Okay? And so they each do things individually that are a little crazy at the time. It's in Mark chapter 5. Uh, this is just after I did a sermon several, uh, probably a month or two ago, about when Jesus cast the demons out of the guy that lived in the cemetery, that one. This is just after that. So they got out of the boat. They did the thing where he cast the demons into the pigs, and the pigs ran into the water. And then they hop in the boat, and they head back across the lake. And this is where we kind of pick it up. It says, Jesus got into the boat. Um, uh, again, and he went back to the other side of the lake where a large crowd gathered around him on the shore. Then a leader of the local synagogue, whose name was Jairus, arrived. When he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, pleading fervently with him, My little daughter is dying, he said. Please come and lay your hands on her. Heal her so she can live. Jesus went with him. And all the people followed crowding, uh, crowding around him. You guys checking out the live stream? Is that what it was? Somebody's listening to the live stream? Yeah, it was Adam. Wow. Thanks for throwing off my groove, jerk. Anyways, um, crowding around him. Um, a woman in the crowd. So this is a, a separate situation, but in the same time frame. All right? A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She had suffered a, a great deal from many doctors, and over the years she had spent everything she had to pay them. But she had gotten no better. In fact, she had gotten worse, and she had heard about Jesus, so she, she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe. For she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. And immediately the bleeding stopped, and, and she could feel her in her body that she'd been healed from this terrible condition. Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out from him. So he, he turned around in the crowd and he asked, who touched my robe? I know that was funny, wasn't it? Who touched, who, I don't know what kind of voice that would have been in. I, I immediately went to the donkey from Shrek for some reason. <laughs> like, who touched my robe? You know? Uh, anyways... <laughs> I am an idiot. Anyways, um, his disciples said to him, uh, look at this crowd pressing around you. How can, how can you ask who touched me? But he kept on looking around to see who had done it. And, and then, he, then the frightened woman trembled at the realization of what had happened to her. 
Like she wasn't just healed, but something happened. There was a, a connection, a moment. There was power involved in that, right? And so um, she's trembling at the a realization of what happened to her. And she, she came and fell to her knees in front of him and told him what she had done. And he said, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. While he was still speaking to her, messengers arrived uh, from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. They told him, your daughter is dead. There's no use in, in even troubling him now. But Jesus overheard them, and he said to Jairus, don't, don't be afraid. Just have faith. Then Jesus stopped the crowd. Um, then Jesus stopped the crowd and, and wouldn't let anybody go uh, with him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And, and when they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw much commotion and weeping and wailing. And he went inside and he asked, what, What's all the commotion? Why, why are you weeping? Why are you crying? The child isn't dead, she's asleep. And the crowd actually laughed at him. And he made them all leave, and he took the girl's father and her mother and his three disciples into a room where the girl was lying, and he was holding her hand, and he, and he said to her, Talitha kuum, which means little girl, get up. Get up. And the girl, who was 12 years old, immediately stood up and walked around. They were, they were overwhelmed and totally amazed, and Jesus gave them strict orders not to tell anyone what had happened, and then he told him, I love this part. He does this more than I think we realize. And then he told him to give her something to eat. He's all about feeding people. I dig that. That might be where the muffin top comes in. Anyways, but so, so there's a lot going on in this story. Like there's, there's two different kind of plot lines. You have, you have a little bit of tension with um, the disciples and their awareness or lack of awareness of what's actually happening and going on, right? On the surface, it just looks like a sick woman and a dude with a dead daughter. But as we look a little deeper, as we kind of peel back things a little more, uh, there are some things that, that we can learn that pertains to us right now. And the first thing is um, that I believe that desperation is a precursor to a miracle. That desperation is a precursor to a miracle. Seriously, you show me one miracle that has happened that didn't come from a place of desperation. That didn't come from a place that was just a, a little jacked up, a little, a little messed up, a little desperate, a little hopeless, right? Like that's where miracles happen. That's the, that's the sweet spot for miracles. I believe that our desperation, it tears down these walls that allow us to see a miracle. Because when we're desperate, we're more vulnerable. We're more receptive to what God is doing. Whenever we're at a situation where we've been just kind of stripped down and all we have is hope that God's going to make it better, then we're able to see it because we're not distracted by everything else, right? As a matter of fact, I believe that he is still doing miracles every single day. We just aren't desperate enough to see them. I believe that, that, that a birth is a miracle. I believe that relationships are miracles. I believe that moments with your children are miracles. I just think we're not desperate enough to see them as miracles until we are. Until something happens that causes us to, to reach this moment of desperation. So this, this woman in this story, she's been sick for 12 years. Can you imagine that? Two weeks sucked. Like covid and it wasn't even that. I've, not, I've been worse sick than I have with COVID, and that was terrible. I didn't like it. I mean, if you think about it, 12 years ago, this woman, she was just living her life, doing her thing, going to work, hanging out with her friends, getting together for margaritas at one of the 12 Mexican restaurants in your small town, right? <laughs> A 
like she was just kind of living her life. But then she got sick, right? Then she got sick. She was, she was exhausted. She, and, and she exhausted every avenue, all of her money. She's got no money. She's got uh, no hope. She's got nothing until she hears about Jesus, right? And then this, this man, this man, this leader of the local synagogue, 12 years ago, he was holding his baby, newborn baby girl in his arms. That's a beautiful thing, right? Uh, from what I've read, it's like she's the only daughter. It didn't say like her brothers or sisters went in whenever Jesus healed. So, so this is their daughter, possibly their firstborn. And 12 years ago, he was holding her in his arms. And he had his daughter and he had his wife and he had a, he had a good job. He was the leader of the local synagogue. And then his daughter gets sick. Like, I can't even think about that. Like, that's one of my biggest fears. I mean, Cooper is 12 right now, same age as the girl in this story. And it's my, my biggest fear. It hits so close to home whenever I was kind of going over this, when I was, whenever I was reading this. And I was like, I, I couldn't do any of that. I just lose my mind. And so, and so um, these, these people's lives were good until something happened, and it shifted their vantage point, which ended up changing how they see everything from here on out because of this, this moment, this interaction, this, this thing, this miracle with Jesus. Check out what James says. He says this. He says, Dear brothers and sisters, when, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. That sounds fine and dandy, doesn't it? So James, he's, he's, he's writing this letter, and he leads with, when the fertilizer hits the fan, consider it a good thing. I don't know that I would lead with that, Right? He leads with, when it all falls apart, be happy about it. And I'm like, I don't, know that I, could, I don't know that I could be that dude that writes a letter to a collective group of people and he says, when it gets bad, be happy. Like that's counterintuitive to me. And so I kind of got a problem with that passage. Uh, I need to do a sermon series about passages I have problems with, right? Um, but, but the thing about it is he's right. Like, as much as I hate the thought of it, as much as I hate the thought of things going bad, going south, as much as I hate the thought of the fertilizer hitting the fan, he is right. It is a good thing. Our desperation, when pointed in the proper places, lays the groundwork for God to show off. Right? And the thing about it is, is that desperation doesn't happen until we are desperate. And a miracle, it just doesn't stop when the problem is fixed. It, it changes the lens by which we view everything else through for the rest of our lives. You're able to, to see things with a, with a tint of, of faith and hope now. Because that bad thing happened and Jesus delivers them from it. When before, all you could see was the problem, the sickness, the potential death, Right? the thing that you're afraid of. You see, it changes the lens by which we view everything through from here on. When we reach that point, when we're desperate enough to come to the feet of Jesus for a miracle. Second thing I noticed about this story is that it takes work and sacrifice. Like if you look at both of these people, like when you just read over it, you don't see it. But it takes some work and some sacrifice to get to this point. Now, now I don't want I don't want this to get hairy. I'm not. I, I'm going to address it real quick. But I, I'm not saying it takes works to see deliverance. I'm saying it takes work. Okay, uh, listing off the things that you do and the things that you didn't do, and 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 checking these boxes. That's works. Okay. 
but working at something is way different than, than that. And it does take work. And, and, and it does take sacrifice to get to this point of reckoning. So think about the two people in this story. This woman. <coughs> Excuse me. This woman, she's been sick for 12 years. Can you imagine? Like, I've been a parent for 12 years, and I'm exhausted. I couldn't imagine being sick for 12 years. Sometimes I'm sick of being a parent for 12 years. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but 12 years. She's been bleeding for 12 years. She's exhausted. She's broke. She's broken. She's probably extremely weak and frail and worn out and a bit hopeless. And then she hears of Jesus. And she's got this, she's got this decision to make, right? This decision is, do I fight for this chance? Do I fight for this chance? I, I, I said that, that it said in the Bible that, that people crowded. The second he stepped on the land, people crowded around him. As he's walking through town, there are crowds of people trying to get to this man. They're mobbing him. And add to that the fact that he's got a 12-person security team, his disciples, right? All young, strapping young men. And she has to sit and think, do I, in, in my condition, do I put forth the effort to push through that? Do I put forth the effort to push through this crowd to get to Jesus, right? Culturally, women don't fight for spot or position at this point in time in history. Right, so, so she has two things going against her. One, that she is weak and frail and sick and broken. And two, she is a woman pushing through men in a world ran by men at this point of time. Physically and culturally, there is work and sacrifice to get to Jesus. We don't see that when we just read over it, do we? But there's a lot that she has to, to resolve and decide to do to get to Jesus. And then this, this man, he is the leader of a local synagogue, okay? Do you know what that means? That means that he is not supposed to like Jesus. Jesus is a troublemaker in his world. Normally, religious leaders, they show up to shut him down. But this one, because of his desperation, because of his, because of his, his daughter being sick, he is desperate. He's, he's on the ground at the feet of the man that he's supposed to hate, begging for him to be everything that everyone says he is. Jewish men bowed to no one except God. Which is kind of ironic because he was bowing to God. Don't know if he believed it until his daughter was healed. But he was bowing to God. Physically and culturally, this man is fighting against everything that his job, his culture, his tradition, his parents, his grandparents, his life has, has told him to. He's fighting against that. More likely, he's sacrificing his career at that very moment. So it takes work and it takes sacrifice. For both of them, it is work and sacrifice. For both of them, this could end badly. For both of them, their desperation brought them to a moment of faith that caused them to invest themselves into getting to Jesus. You do things you normally wouldn't do. You spend things you normally wouldn't spend. You take time you normally wouldn't take whenever you are so desperate to get to Jesus. Honestly, I don't believe any of that story is different from us now. I believe we got to work. I don't believe we have to keep track of works, but I believe we got to work. And I believe that we have to sacrifice to get to him, right? It starts with a sacrifice just to get to church. But then beyond there, there's some work to be done. There's some sacrifices to be made, right? Look at this verse Jesus says to his disciples here. Um, it says, then Jesus said to his disciples, if, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. 
In other translations, it says deny yourself, which I think is one of the hardest things in the world to do, right? Because nobody knows how to run my life better than me, except maybe my wife. I'm saying that because she's here today, and I'm scared of her. But anyways, um, <coughs> but do you know? Do you know what it means to to when he says take up your cross? Do you understand what that means when he says that? He's not saying go down to the jewelry store and and, and find a pair of nice cross shaped earrings. Okay, he's not saying wear a cheesy T-shirt that says, you know, one cross, three nails, four given, you know, something like that. He's not, he's not saying that. That's, that's not what it is. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't a meme on your Facebook feed that says, if you don't share this, you don't love me. You know, gosh, those people, <laughs> Right? Prove you're my follower by liking and sharing. Yeah. I, I think in this moment when Jesus is talking to his disciples, that's exactly what he envisioned, right? Man, all those people that claim to love me don't click. This stupid. Anyways, so, but the cross wasn't that. The cross wasn't that. The cross was a weapon of torture. Like when he says this, that is a weapon of torture. That meant be prepared to give up your life so that you can live the life that I created you for. That's what he's saying. Be prepared to give up your life so that you can live the life that I created you for. And you know what that takes? That takes work and that takes sacrifice. That takes awareness, right? That takes denying yourself, taking up your cross, and then putting in the work to follow him. Because if you're going to follow him, you got to move, right? He doesn't say, deny yourself, take up your cross, and stand next to me. You want to know why? Because he's moving. And if you're going to follow him, you've got to move too. And the third thing, which this is one of those things that I, that I still, like it doesn't register in my mind. The third thing is, he says, your suffering is over. God, wouldn't that be nice? Right? Your suffering is over. I I think this is, I think this statement is craziness. (laughs) I mean, it's it's nice, it's it's good to think about, but I think the statement is craziness. He says, Your suffering is over, but but this man and this woman, they got the miracle, okay? That's great. But guess what? The daughter died eventually, just not that day. Guess what? He had to deal with the fallout from his job. Guess what? The woman died eventually, right? It's not like the the suffering is over. How is the suffering over? They still got stuff that they've got to deal with with life. They've been given a second chance at it, but they still got to live it, right? And so when he says your suffering is over, what, what does that even freaking mean? They will, they will still see tough times. They will still see moments of desperation. But because they have, now I need you to listen to me. Because they've seen Jesus move on their behalf, their outlook changes. And so it's not suffering, right? What it is now is a precursor to a miracle. And that's not suffering. That's exciting, isn't it? I had this, I had this moment in my life. Um, we had like a rough like three-year run. Okay, it was like between 2005 and 2008. In 2005, my wife's grandpa got really sick, like deathly sick. And we're a fairly newlywed couple. We live uh, a couple hours away. She's driving back and forth. I'm trying to work. We're both trying to go to school. Like, like it felt crazy, like we were in a whirlwind, right? And then about a, a year later, we lost our daughter. And then how do you even deal with that? And then a year after that, my wife's brother dies. And then a year after that, we become parents. And we have this little life that we're responsible for. But we're also fighting depression. And we're also trying to keep it on the rails. And then two weeks after Cooper's born, my mom dies. And so all this in a three-year period, right? All this in, in such a short 
time in our life and we're newlyweds and we're trying to get it together. We still ain't got it together, y'all. But, um, and I had this question through all of this. I had this question. Sometimes I screamed it. Sometimes I yelled it. Sometimes I cried it. Sometimes, sometimes I, I whispered it. And it was simply, why? Like, seriously, I'm a minister. I'm a faithful husband. I, I feel like I'm a good son, a good brother, a good friend. Like, I, I am doing the works. I'm checking the boxes. Right? That's different from the work. But my question was, why? Like, like, why would you take away the child of a youth pastor? Like, of all the screwed up meth head people in this world, why the youth minister? But that's not my question anymore. Like, that was the wrong question to ask. That was a, a question of suffering. Because, because the gift of making it through those years allowed me a very different vantage point. The gift of, of surviving three years that are supposed to tear marriages apart, but I, I'm still together with my wife, that, that, that gave us a very different vantage point. And, and when tough times come about, I don't ask why anymore. I ask, what are you up to? I don't ask him why. I'm like, what are, what are you doing? How are you fixing to show off? That's not suffering. That's exciting. Because when God shows off, it's exciting. Right? Because God will never, ever waste a thing. He doesn't waste a tear. He doesn't waste a moment. He will not waste an issue. He will take that issue and he will donkey kick it in the face until it becomes a miracle. Like, seriously. Like, he'll take those things that we're wrestling with, those things that are rocking our world, and, and, and he will turn it into something that's not suffering, but something that's exciting. Because he's God. And not only is he God, but he's good. And not only is he good, but he's great. And since he's great, he can do that. And since he's good, he does do that. And once you experience that a time or two, it's not suffering anymore. It's not fear anymore. It's more like giddy anticipation of what he's going to do, right? It's more like whenever things don't feel like they're supposed to feel, it's almost like you're on the cusp of seeing a miracle. And it's beautiful, right? But that doesn't just happen. That, that's not something that just happens. It takes, it takes willingness to, to leverage your desperation, Right? Because that breaks down the walls. And now we see these things that are every day that are miracles because we're positioned, we're postured to see that for what it is as opposed to be afraid of it, as opposed for it to be the thing that's looming over us. Right? We're not afraid anymore, but we're positioned. Our desperation positions us for a miracle. But that also takes work and sacrifice to get to the feet of Jesus. You want to know what, what one of my biggest issues, one of my biggest, uh, one of the biggest things that I have to work on to get to the feet of Jesus? Pride. Like, it's not, it doesn't feel cool to be desperate. It doesn't feel cool to surrender. It, it doesn't feel good to be on your face in the dirt in front of anybody. It doesn't. But that's my pride, right? That's something I have to work on. That's work because it does whenever you can be in that position where you're desperate enough to be on your face in the dirt in front of the right one. Then, you, then you're met with giddy anticipation, right? It, it, it takes that change in posture to allow suffering to go when he says your suffering is over, he is right. It's hard to agree with when you're suffering, but he's right. Your suffering is over. When he says that, it takes you to a different place, a place of anticipation, right? 
a place of excitement even. Whenever, instead of asking why, you can ask, what are you up to? What are you doing? And so this story is a story of investment. It's not a story of whether you take 10% or 12% or what is a tithe, what is an offering. It's not a, it's not a story of that. It's not, an off, it's not a story of, of what are my talents and how should I use them. It's not that. But it's the story of this, this mental, emotional, spiritual, and physical investment into getting to the feet of Jesus, into seeing that miracle, in, in, into ending your suffering. And I think we're going to talk a little bit more about that next Sunday night. Like, how does that flesh out for us, right? Like, if we can, if we can take today and think about the attitude that comes with investing ourselves, then all those other things that we have questions about, what and how, and how much to invest, all those other things will come from, from that mindset. And it's not going to be as crazy to think about, right? And so we're going to talk about that a little bit as it pertains to Fall City Christian Church, as it pertains to Madison, Indiana, as it pertains to who it is we are, what we've done up to this point, what we would like to do, and what it takes to get that done. You know? I'm glad that we're able to do that face-to-face because Facebook Live from my front room is super awkward. I never know if my... I never know if my kids are going to be fighting or if my dog is going to be barking. One time I was, I don't know if I should tell this, (coughs) so I'm going to. (laughs) One time I was literally, I was literally on a, um, a Google Meets meeting, a few people on this meeting, and we've got this cat condo behind us. You know what a cat condo is? It's like this big six-foot thing that my cat can climb on and scratch on and sleep on and lay on and shed on. Well, shed on. Um, the other one's a litter box. I don't know if you guys know that or not. But um, I'm on this meeting, and, and this cat condo is perfectly in the frame behind my left shoulder. And there is my cat bathing itself with its back leg straight up in the air. And um, our, our video game developer guy, he, like, types it in the chat so he doesn't say it. He's like, dude, you're a cat. That's all he had to say. And I turn around, and, and this cat has its leg straight up in the air, and it's giving itself a, a, a bath in the nether regions. And, um, and of course, here I am on this, this Google Meet, <laughs> and I'm yelling at my cat in front of these people. I'm trying to convince into investing into our video game. It's crazy. Anyways, so it's awkward, and I would rather – be awkward face-to-face than awkward with my cat giving itself a bath behind me. So uh, we are starting a new series next week, and I'm excited about it. Um, does anybody know what major, guys, what major holiday is in February? Valentine's Day. I said guys. <laughs> and, and the one person that probably doesn't get to celebrate it. <laughs> it's four women from guys, right? No? Oh, listen to her, Aaron. I'm just saying. Um, but it, the series is called Tough Love, and we're going to talk about love a little bit, and we're going to talk about what makes it tough and how it can be tough sometimes. All right? Cool? I'm excited about it. It's going to be fun. It's going to be a good time. We're going to have a good time. So I'm going to pray. Worship team is going to come up. Hey, Listen. If you, um, if you have a decision, if you need prayer, if there's something going on, if you're, if you're kind of at that point of desperation, um, since I'm not playing, I'll be standing here in the back. If you need somebody to pray with you, to talk with you, come find me. Come find one of our leaders. If you need somebody, find me. If uh, I can point you to somebody who is probably more articulate and less sarcastic than me, if that's what you need in your life. Um, 
but I'm going to pray, and during this song, if you need anything, uh, come back and find me. Uh, Father, we thank you so much for this day of life you've given us. We thank you for your willingness to, to take away our suffering, to give us a new way to look at really everything. We thank you for moments and situations that bring about a desperation that strips everything away so that we can get to you. I pray, Lord, that we can take advantage of that, that we can, that we can see this for what it is and be willing to invest <coughs> and invest ourselves to get to you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You guys can go ahead and stand.
still stands Great is your faithfulness Faithfulness Now I'm still in your hands And this is my confidence You never fail Your promise still stands Great is Have a fantastic week, and we will see you next Sunday. Party. Party. Good job, you guys. <laughs>